I'm happy y'all are here to join us tonight. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Randall, for having us. Um, so first, who am I? As that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Randolph. You probably included most of the stuff I had and other things as well. Been the DBA for over 20 years, mainly working with SQL Server, then enough of the other relational databases, you know, just enough so I can say I can do some damage. Uh, I mainly work in transactional systems, but I've done a little bit with data marts and warehouses, you know, just enough so you can say I can do some damage. I'm a board member of the New England SQL User Group, which is based in the greater Boston area. Uh, so help out there as much as I can. I'm data platform community speaker, IDEA ACE class of 2020. So thanks to IDEA for, for having such a program. And yes, I am the reigning speaker idol winner because we did not have one at the summit this past year because it's too hard to do virtually. So I will claim that title. It, there were, it was a tough year. So I'm very proud of that win. And as he mentioned, I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. It's very recent and still a little surreal, but that's not the important stuff about me. The important stuff is stuff that, like, I'm the alto section leader of my choir. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to sing together soon. I usually, I used to go to bluegrass trams regularly. Again, looking forward to having those up and running again, because I miss making music with people. I've been learning guitar and now mandolin. Um, and I'm kind of a musical theater geek. My guess, Randolph, is you can probably out musical theater geek me anytime, but I'd love the chance to have those conversations with you. And yes, that's me and with Bernadette Peters after seeing her in Stephen Sondheim's uh, Little Night Music with Elaine Stritch, just because I can say I saw that. So with that, that may not be the reason most of y'all are here. You want to talk about select statements or beyond the basic select statements. So when we talk about that, I just want to start off with a statement and to kind of think about what we do. Who did not execute a select statement today? And I say this because it's the little things that you do that sometimes you don't realize you actually did execute a select statement. You may have executed several and not known it. Have you ever run a trace and started management studio or Azure data studio and connected to a database? I, I confirmed that one because if you haven't, it's really interesting because as soon as you connect, there are a whole bunch of statements that get executed behind the scenes. So you probably executed a select statement and didn't even know it. Uh, with the way we work with databases these days, it, it could be possible that you didn't if you were in meetings all day or did nothing that against a database. But pretty much select statements are the basis of what we do. They are in everything. I do a T-SQL 101 session where I talk about how you write transactions you know, basic T-SQL statements, the select, insert, update, and delete. And I start by saying, if you can write a select statement, you can write all of these others because it's such the fundamental of what we do with SQL. And not often when we think our select statements, we start with, well, yeah, this is a select statement right here. And, and it's a pretty basic select statement, but to be honest, these aren't the ones that are problematic, right? It's very simple but it also goes really easy from something like this to something like this. And for the record, I wrote this one myself by hand. I'm kind of proud of it because it's really hard to write a SQL statement like this by yourself. I mean, it actually isn't that hard. There's not really too many complicated things that you do. And normally when we see stuff like this, we wanna blame that third party data layer ORM that creates horrible, horrible, just, just just horrible select statements that we spend hours and hours trying to tune and say, hey, are you sure you don't want something else to, to create a select statement for you? But it's still very easy for us to take the basic things that we do with SQL, put them together, and wind up with something like this that we then have to troubleshoot. So our goal is to kind of take these elements apart and really kind of figure out the, the basic ways that we start building upon our select statements that make them not so basic anymore and things to kind of think about, about how we use them, why we want to use them, and how we can make sure that we're using them effectively. So our agenda is pretty simple. We're going to break this into two parts. First, we're going to talk about selecting from what I'm calling fancy row sets. Not that they're really that 
fancy, but we're taking our select statements and the how we're getting that row set is why I'm kind of calling it fancy because it's not, you know, your typical from table. And then we're going to talk about selecting our fancy column lists from row sets. And again, they're not necessarily fancy, although they can be really cool, actually. That some of those actually can get fancy. But again, it's not something super crazy, but these are things that we do every day that we add, and it's what makes our column list a little more than just your simple basic select column. So with that, I want to start by going back to our logical order of operations. This is how logically SQL Server is going to put together our select statements. And the reason I want to go over this is because I think a lot of how we write our SQL statements is us trying to take advantage of this. Well, if SQL Server is going to put it this way, then I'm going to write my query this way so SQL Server will use it. And I think it's a really good refresher so we understand what we're looking for and figuring out why we make the choices we do when we when we make our selects a little, little more complicated. So it starts off with our from clause. So our starting table, where are we, where's our data living from? Where are we selecting our data from? Then it moves to the on clause. So this is how our tables join together. What are those conditions? And I find it's interesting that it's after that point, it's the outer clause. What data may or may not exist. It's after we join our tables together and figure out those join conditions that then we say, OK, we have a left join here, so there may not be a row. Then we come to our where clause. So we start off by identifying the tables that are involved. Now we can start eliminating the rows that we don't need. So we're really just getting the rows we want, our where clause. Then we roll everything up to our group by. Usually we're getting ready. When we think group by, we think aggregates because we think we're going to do something aggregate with aggregates later on. Um, so now we are rolling up that row set to a particular level. And from there, we can apply another condition onto it, another kind of elimination, a where clause for our group by. And at this point, Instead, we could be going to order by, but instead we jump back to our select statement. So now we're thinking about the columns. So the first thing SQL Server is doing is logically it's saying, what are all the rows that I need to deal with for my data? And now we can figure out what columns on those rows are we dealing with? And then we come to distinct. So now that we know which columns, now we can really figure out what needs to, what what are duplicates and it's interesting to remember that distinct and group by are different because they are not the same we tend to use them interchangeably but they aren't so also you know sometimes i'll see on conditions or where condition where clause conditions and the on clause like we're using them interchangeably but logically that's not quite how it works either but we feel like they come up with the same results so we tend to do that sometimes but at this point, we have all the columns that we need. We, are rows are, are, we know which rows are, of data are being returned. And at this point, SQL Server can then turn its attention to things like order by. How are you sorting everything? This is, you know, if you think about it, this is kind of why here's where you want to go. If you need your stuff sorted and ordered by a particular thing, everything else has to exist first. And it's really important when we think about how our queries are built. That order by is kind of one of the last things that it's doing. And only after that, we then get the top number of rows. So five, top five rows or top 5% out of all these rows. So it's not shortcutting when we say we need top five rows when there are 5 million records that could be returned because SQL Server already has to do the work to figure out what those 5 million records are, what order they're being returned in before it can say what those top five are. So all the stuff has to go into account first. And I think a lot of what we do, we try to work within those bounds. We want to figure out what tables we're getting first, what data, what rows we're getting, trying to condense those first so SQL Server can then work its way out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we're going to kind of look at how we construct those different things to, that we do to try to work within these confines. So see if it works and see where it doesn't. So with this, 
I think it's time to get fancy. Uh, and as I keep saying, that word fancy is in quotes for, for a reason. Now, if you really well, you know, if you do a lot of tuning and this, you know, you've been doing this for a while, some of these things that we're going to start with, you're going to be, Deborah, this, this isn't really fancy. It's really not that, you know, it's still kind of simple. And yeah, it is. We're going to start kind of with the, the initial things that we do, and we're going to look on how we build those. So we're not going to get too advanced, but we still want to think about the basic things, the everything the everything objects that we see, everything techniques that we do all the time. Because honestly, I see a lot of those things every day. And honestly, that's kind of what I work with. And it's still easy to take these things that we do every day and have problems with them. Or we build on them in a way where if we're not careful, that's where we're going to start getting into performance issues. So that's why I kind of want to take it back to the basics of the basic elements of how we build upon these things. So I'm going to go through these and then we're going to go through the demos and we can talk more about those that way. So let's get started. I'm going to start off with a derived table. This is the first thing that we do that complicates our select statement. So all a derived table is, is a select statement that we're using as a table. So whatever is in that column list are the only columns available to us from that select statement that we can use and as a table. So if it's not here, we can't use it here. It's the first thing that we do and using a select statement as a table is the first thing that we do that kind of builds out that co more complicated select statement. So how do we build on derived tables? CTEs or common table expressions. So essentially what we're doing is it looks a lot like our derived table because you can see here we have a select statement. But what's different is the placement and what you can do with it. The placement is before our select. A lot of people like CTEs because they think the code is cleaner than or it looks cleaner than just putting it in a derived table. Um, but CTEs can be powerful because you can have CTEs reference other CTEs and you can do some cool things with them. Uh, but we'll talk some stuff about performance things. But one of the other things I want to talk about when we look at the syntax of CTE is our friend the semicolon. And this is where we talk more about semicolons than probably any other time. For a while now, SQL Server wants us to end every statement with a semicolon. In fact, you may be looking at this and saying, hey, Deborah, uh, I think you're missing something over here because I am. I didn't put a semicolon at the end of my statement here. And, and it's a hard thing if you've been writing SQL for a long time, trying to get us to, to use a semicolon without using a formatter is just difficult. Some of us are just entrenched in that bad habit. But a CTE requires it. A CTE, there must be a semicolon somewhere before these the declaration of your CTE. And it pretty much has to do with this, the word with. Because with is a keyword for SQL Server and it's used in several other places. For example, back database with compression. So because we're using that word with in other places, how do we know if it's a CTE or if there's bad syntax somewhere? Well, that's our friend the semicolon. Because if there's a semicolon, if you have multiple statements in a batch and the first statement is not the word with for a CTE, SQL Server needs some way to say, hey, this statement is done. I can now start this one. The first word is with and I know it's a CTE. So you have to have a semicolon somewhere before the word with, either at the end of the statement before or right in front of the word with. I always do it this way because this way I know it's there. Um, you can have two semicolons next to each other and it doesn't create syntax errors, uh, but whatever it is, just make sure you have a semicolon before with whatever you name your CTE. So as I said, it's, a, it's the most I probably ever talk about a semicolon in SQL, um, so, but it's important for the syntax. So enough about semicolons. Um, so let's move on. How can we build on this idea of a CTE? How, how do we do that? 
how about a view? And essentially what a view is and why I'm considering this was part of my fancy select statement is it's a saved select statement. So that derived table or that select statement with a CTE, you can save and you've made it reusable. And so now that you have this save select statement, you can pull it out and you can use it as your from clause. It's your fancy row set. It's your saved select statement, your saved derived table. And being able to share that code is great or can be. So now I've got the view. How do I build on a view? What, what, how can I make a view more fancy? How about I parameterize it? User defined functions. And I say that because a user defined function isn't truly a parameterized view, but it's a statement that I heard when it was first introduced and it makes a lot of sense. Because a view, you have to go through everything and or you have to select from the view and then add your where clause and, and any parameters that come in with it. For a function, you're passing in the parameters that you can then add to your select statement. So your select statement is always dealing with just that data. So you're able to kind of customize the view for whatever parameters you need to pass in. And that's what we see here. The table define or the table value functions. There are a couple, there are two types of table valued functions, inline table valued functions and multi-statement table valued functions. We'll go into those a little more later. But essentially, our row set, we've added a parameter into our saved select statement, and we can use that as our row set. Kind of fancy, maybe debatable, but it is one of those things that we do that complicates our select statements. The thing with user defined functions is there's two types, and this is where we move from our fancy row sets into our fancy column sets, because there is also another type of function called a scalar function. And we can see that right here. So we can use it as we would any other column, select our column list and we can include our function as part of it. So now we've got whatever logic we need from our function, we can pull it back in our column list. And so now our, our, we can do a little bit more with of logic that way. So there's one, so now that we're talking about fancy row sets, what other fancy row sets can we do? windowed functions, so a separate type of function. Um, but these are the built-in window functions that we get from SQL Server, as opposed to the user-defined ones that we create. But the what we can do with windowed functions, this is probably where I'm gonna say this stuff gets fancy because some of the stuff is really cool and some of the calculations and how we can use these and what we can do with the data on a column level is actually really uh, on a row level, the row level for the columns, it's actually pretty cool stuff. Um, the first time I could use one of these windowed functions, I was really disappointed because I'm the only DBA for the team and I'm looking around and like, who's gonna get how cool this is and there's no one here. Um, but I think they're kind of cool. And because of that and what we can do, that flexibility, I, I think windowed functions are, are some pretty cool stuff and some pretty cool functionality. So I'm gonna get a sip of water and uh, we'll, we'll jump over to demos, but first, are there any initial questions or things that you want me to make sure I address if we get into those in the demos? Anything yet? I don't see any raised hands, but please feel free to use the reactions option to raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. Okay, so let's move over to our, our demos. So. I have a database here that I'm calling Deb's AdventureWorks. So essentially, I have taken the AdventureWorks database. I've applied a script by Jonathan Cajas um, that he made available on one of blog posts, and then I made a couple other additional changes so I could come up with these demos for you. Um, all of these scripts, and including the one to modify the database, are going to be available on my GitHub, and I have a, a connection to that through my blog. So definitely. Um, those will be available to you afterwards. I'm also going to uh, upload a version of the PowerPoint to y'all as well. Um, I always like doing that after the sessions just in case I miss something along the way. So, but you'll be able to take these and, you know, play with them yourselves if you wanted to learn more about them. So, we're in the, the AdventureWorks database. So, we're going to start with our derived tables 
and I'm going to make sure we're going to look at the execution plans that come along with these. So the first example is your single derived table. So I have a couple. Uh, it's pretty simple. I have I'm going to select for my customer table, the sales order header table, and then I've got my derived call my derived table right here where I'm selecting stuff from the sales order detail, but I wanted to group by them. So I wanted to get a couple of information before I join to the other tables. So, you know, just very simple select statement. And when I look at my execution plan, pull this up so you see a little bit more, you can see that I've got my customer table here, my header, and then you can see my sales order detail and all the aggregates here before it joins to the others. And when I was talking about the logical order of operations, this is kind of why I created that derived table. I wanted all of my sales order table information to be grouped together, and then I wanted it to be joined to the others. So I can look at the plan and, hey, that kind of works. And the thing with derived tables is you can have nested derived tables. You can put a derived table in a derived table. So that's my next example. So I'm going to take this. I want to do a couple more aggregates based on my customer and sales order header information. Join that again to my sales order detail information, my, that, same, that same derived table one. And now I've got my derived table two. Thanks. Where's my cursor? There it is. So I've got nested subqueries, nested derived tables joined to my salesperson table. So let's just take a quick look at that. And I get my execution plan. And it's interesting because I described why I put the derived tables together, but we don't quite see that the same way. We see our header and detail put together here, then it's joined to person and customer. And every time I run this, I feel like it, it keeps changing on me too. But it's not necessarily the way we wanted it because my outer one is a salesperson, but my join for detail and header is going to person before it's going to customer, which isn't quite the way I wrote it, which tells me that SQL Server doesn't really follow the logical order of operations or the word logical is kind of the key thing. Um, it is, it's just that, it's logical. SQL Server looked at my query and said, you know what, I see what you're doing here, you're joining all of the stuff, but there's a better way for me to put all of this stuff together. So I'm going to do it this way. And this is now why we have this execution plan. So even though some of the basic code, like this, uh, the sales order detail aggregate derived table is the same exact code as I used before, SQL Server doesn't want to use it that way. It decided there was a cheaper way to, to, to come up with the same results, and that's what it went with. So the reason I want to point that out is when we're troubleshooting queries and we, we get the drive table working well, and then we start joining it, and all of a sudden performance goes out the door, it could be because when SQL Server puts everything in context, it's not putting things together the way we wrote it and the way we thought it was going to put things together. And I've probably spent many, many years, I'm thinking of an exact query where I've spent lots of time tuning that derived query only to have it be horrible as part of the, the full one. And, and, and this is pretty much why I was having trouble tuning it. So that's kind of the basics of our derived table. So because it's something we use fairly often, I want to kind of move into the CTEs. So now, so now we're kind of, making derived tables fancy. We're making them CTEs. So I'm going to make sure I've got my execution plan on. So I'm going to start with my derived table from that that I just ran. And I'm also going to run it same time with a CTE. And my CTE is that innermost derived table that I've been working with. So I now have a CTE. And you can see here, instead of having my drive table, I'm calling my CTE. So I'm running these two side by side. And let's take a quick look at the execution plan. So first thing is I'm going to get my properties tab open here so I can do things like see how long they took. Um, one thing I will point out is I know query cost is kind of a relative thing. and I don't want to say it lies to us, but 
it can. Um, it's not always accurate. I'll use it as a guide to say, I'm running through things. It's anything look like it's more expensive or not. And then we can go into the details. Right now, it's looking like these two are fairly similar. And if I look at the shape of, of this query plan, it's what I saw before. And if I look at the shape of my CTE, it actually kind of looks the same. So we can get some more information about this by looking at our properties, which is why I wanted to pull it up over here. And I can do things, look at my query time stat to see that this one took an elapsed time of 458 milliseconds. And I can go here and I can go back to my select and I can see my query time stats, 271. Well, that's not a lot of data. I'm not sure if, if it's necessarily faster or not. We can see, but it is interesting that this did take less time to run. But here's the other thing that I'm kind of curious about. The, the plan shapes are, are pretty similar. So I want to look at the, my query plan hash, which says a lot. The, the query hash is SQL Server taking the select statement and creating its hash. This is a query to execute it. The query plan hash is this query plan created as a hash. So you have 0 to 4, 4C6F32A. We'll just start with that. And if I go down here, I see 4C6F32A. So essentially, it's running the same query. It's the same query plan for both of these queries. So SQL Server is really saying that CTE is a derived table. I have a whole bunch of references at the end of my slide deck for everyone. And one of them is a blog post from Eric Darling. Um, I remember he gave a session about query tuning. And one of the things that he talked about was how a CTE, we keep thinking it's it's materialized. It's It does everything, it's saved, and then we can reuse it. And it's not. A CTE is just the select statement. Um, so it is a runtime value. So it kind of makes sense that it's being treated as a derived table because it, it essentially, in this case, it, it essentially is. We just have it located in a different part of our select statement. So if we had to call that CTE multiple times, it's the same as calling that same select statement or same drive table multiple times. So it's actually a really important key thing to think about. Eric Darling explains it much better, and that's why I attached a blog post so you can use that as a reference if you're dealing with CTEs. No. I like CTEs. I thought they were really cool when they first came out. And I was so excited the first time I got to use one. I put one in a store procedure and I sent it out, went to production. And about a week later, my manager comes like, hey, Deborah, that, that store procedure is not good. It's performing horribly. So I did some research. Why is this returning so bad? What happened here? And I found that one blog post or, or one website that I'm never, ever, ever going to find again because I tried and it's I'm never going to find it, but it said only use a CTE if you need a CTE function. So it gets into, well, how can I figure out if I need a CTE or not? Well, you can do comparisons like this, but the other thing it gets into the question of CTE versus temp tables, because a lot of people use CTEs to get rid of temp tables because then you don't have to deal with getting the data first and then putting into the select statement. But oftentimes I find if I needed a CTE or I thought I needed a CTE, what, and I had those performance issues, I often solved them by using a temp table. So let's kind of take a look and, and kind of think about that. So I want to compare the CTE versus temp table. So I have my two statements above. So I'm creating a temp table and I like creating primary keys on my temp tables because it's an actual table. We can add primary keys for, for performance. I'm going to insert my data, and then I'm running my same select statement that I had been, but instead of a derived table or CTE, I'm re referencing my temp table. And then, of course, I'm, I'm going to drop my temp table at the end. So let's run all three of these together, and we'll look at the query plans. And when we look at it, we know we need to take a grain of salt because there is cost with creating a temp table because I am doing an insert, and there is a cost associated to that. So I want to kind of hold that aside and we'll get back to that in just a second, but I want to go ahead and look at our execution plans. 
So again, query cost is relative. We know these two are the same query plans. Our derived table this time, let's see how long it took. It took 336 milliseconds. Our CTE took 504 milliseconds. So tonight our derived table is actually a little bit faster than our CTE. We're gonna skip over our select statement for our insert into the temp table for now. And now we're gonna look using our select statement with the temp table and it got 408 milliseconds. And I promise every time I do this and do this demo, I get different results. Um, so we, so, and sometimes I get better results with the temp table. Sometimes I get result, better results with CTEs. Um, sometimes I get better results depending on which version of SQL Server I'm using. And now I have to go back and remember what the other ones were. 408 versus 336 and 504. Yeah, so, Whoops, helps if I go. So this one kind of fit in the middle between the two. It's These are small queries, so only 100 milliseconds in between. But imagine if you're dealing with larger amounts of data. But again, as I said, CTEs and drive tables, that information is not saved first and we're not materialized. Where a temp table, the data is. So it's one of those things where you're going to have to test with your data set because like I said, this is maybe a little too small to tell and 100 milliseconds may not matter. But if I am running a stored procedure and I need that information in that derived table or that CTE or if, if I need that select statement multiple times throughout, I may bet be better off using a temp table because it is materialized. It is an actual table with statistics that you can put indexes on and you can do things to help improve performance, assuming that you're being nice to your TempDB as well um, and you have all that set up properly. It's one of those things to test. Like I said, when I was burned really, really badly by CTEs, I ended up replacing them with temp tables. So every time I create CTEs, I always try to go do a back and forth and do the due diligence. Which one am I truly getting better performance with, with the data that I need and with how I'm using my data? So I always say that because CTEs do have that known issue of performance issues. I don't know if there's a particular, I haven't found that the blog post that says these are the ones that cause problems and these are the ones that aren't, but it's just something that you, you wanna kind of keep an eye on and how it works for you may work differently than how it worked for me. But what are our CTE goods are good for? Because there is a good use for CTEs, and I think it's pretty cool, and it's something we use pretty frequently. And that is for hierarchies. And this is really cool. And this is why when we start talking about fancy row sets, hierarchies in a single select statement, that's pretty cool. And that's one of those functionalities where if you hadn't played with CTEs and figured out the hierarchy capabilities, this is pretty cool. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at my database and I want to get a pretty much an organizational chart. I want to see my managers and I want to relate who's who reports to whom. So I'm starting off with my CTE. I'm declaring it here. And I'm looking for my employee information and where the manager business entity ID is and all. So I want to get the first person on the on the chain. I'm doing a union all, and if you're doing hierarchies, it must be union all. And then I'm doing, again, because it's a union all, all of the column list has to be the same. I'm doing some fun stuff here so you can see the results later in my final select statement. But really notice two things about the from statement. So my from statement, I'm again pulling from my employee table, but look at what I'm joining to, employee CTE. Employee CTE, I'm in the middle of my CTE and I'm referencing the CTE that I'm creating. That's pretty cool because a CTE can reference itself or any CTE above it in the select statement. So, but the fact that I can self reference the st select statement that I'm in the middle of creating, I think it's a pretty cool piece of functionality. So, when I run all of this, You can kind of see, this is the column that I created at the end. 
And it's cool because I'm able to create a visual so you can see what changes. You can see the hierarchy, you can see the org chart list and how deep things go. And if you think about if you didn't have this ability to create hierarchies, how would you show this before? You'd have to do multiple joins to the same table or do a temp table and constantly update that. Uh, what if you didn't know how deep your org chart was? Here, you don't even have to worry about it. SQL Server figures it out for you. I mean, there are limitations to the limits for hierarchies. And as you start learning how to create them, it, it can be a little tricky. But I, I think this is a pretty cool piece of functionality and a really nice, easy, slick way to to see an org chart for or, or create a hierarchy so in your one single select statement. So I, I think that kind of create, you know, I think that counts as fancy. So any questions about that so far? No questions. I just had a comment that I wanted to make because I'm that person. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that you use the the letters CTE in the names of your CTEs, and I just wanted to mention that it's not required to call them CTEs. You can call them anything you like. Yes. And I, I, I am one of the people where I agree, you know, with the naming conventions. Sometimes I like putting CTE because it's easy for me to say when I look at a select statement what it is. Um, it is cool, though, if Management Studio is one of the tricks I found a couple years ago, um, is if you hover over it, um, I, hopefully you can see it, but in gray, it tells you that it's a common table expression. So that's from Management Studio. Uh, the yellow, I actually have a SQL prompt here as well. And for SQL prompt, it actually gives you the summary, which is actually, that's actually kind of cool. I didn't realize it could do that. So yeah, I like putting the word CTE. You're right that for naming convention, it does not have to be there. I tend to do that because I find it's easier to identify what it is in my select statements. So yes, thank you. That's a very good point. Any other questions? Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Oleg. Okay. Is if there's no other questions, I don't yeah, know if I, you had a question, Oleg. I wasn't sure if Oleg had a question. Um, All right. So. If so, we can we can bring we can come up come back later too. Yes, definitely. All right, so now let's move into views. So again, views don't feel like they're in a sense they're fancy, but again, it's saving our select statement for reuse. Um, and because the view, it's a select statement. It's what we have before. Everything else we can put in a select statement. A single select statement we can do with a view. So a C, if we can't put a temp table, you could use a CTE and create your view. So let's kind of take a look at these. So I've turned on my execution plans. So this is a view that is from AdventureWorks. I'm using Microsoft's code or whoever created AdventureWorks code. And so I've done a little formatting so it makes it easier to read. But we have a pretty basic select statement here where we have a bunch of columns from a whole bunch of tables. Some of them are inner joins, some of them are outer joins, and we're just selecting information. So I'm going to do, do some basic selects from our view. So the first one is I'm selecting all the columns from the view by itself. Pretty straightforward. And when I look at my execution plan, we can see that it's selecting pretty much everything. So from our tables over here, all the way down here, are all the tables and all the, the columns. Noth nothing to expect. To ex it's pretty much what we expected because we just ran that select statement by itself. When we start getting in trouble in views or when we start thinking we get in trouble in, in views is when we start having to use them for other tables and start joining them to other tables. For example, I don't need all of the columns from the view I just want to get a couple of them and I want to join it to my person table because I need one more piece of information. So I'm just doing it as a straight join. Nothing, nothing too crazy. But when I look at the execution plan, some of it's what I expect. I see my person, salesperson, some of the other information, but also I start going down here and I start seeing tables like email address and person phone. And while those are some of the tables that are used in the view. We're not selecting anything from them. 
but they're still appearing as part of our query plan. So because SQL Server does try to eliminate tables that it's not using things from. And it does it for some of our left join tables or some of the other tables where we're not pulling data from, but it didn't figure it out for all of them. So because it's not figuring it out, because it's not directly part of the query, we get in trouble and SQL Server starts adding those to it. And when you start nesting views, because you can have a view selecting from a view that selects from a view that selects from a view and so on, once you start nesting them, you really start having a problem because SQL Server has trouble figuring out what it actually needs, what it doesn't need. And so the cost that it's coming up with is not necessarily the best cost because this is doing a lot more work than if I were just selecting from the tables that we need. You know, just for a quick comparison, here we have a pretty active execution plan. We go down here, it, it's much smaller, it's much cleaner because we're only selecting what we need. It's not to say that views are horrible and there's no reason for them. There's lots of reasons. Maybe you need reports. Maybe you're you're creating, uh, you, you need to hide the name of columns or joins or make something that's easy for some user to uh, to consume the data. Views are really useful. But depending on what we're using the view for, stuff like this, it, it may not be as useful. But again, this is why we're testing. We're looking at our performance and trying to you know, see how these select queries perform. But what is cool about a view, and this is what can make them fancy, are the com are, is the concept of an indexed view. So we have this view right here. And it is it is a view, and it is looks like every other view. But we can do two things. One, we call it schema binding. So this means that if we have to change the underlying schema of a table, we can't do it. We have to drop the view first, and then we can change the underlying the table and then we can recreate our view on top of that. The other thing is I'm creating a clustered index on my view. This has a lot of cool potentials if you think about it because what is an index? It's saving the, the data off so you can use it. it. So you're not necessarily hitting the underlying tables. You're and especially when we talk about a clustered index which saves the entire data row. We've now pretty much it's called a materialized view because we're saving that result set off for us to use when it's appropriate. And it's got a lot of cool advantages because instead of selecting of all those tables, if we can use the index, which already has the results, we can get better performance. It does mean that there are situations you need to think about what tables it works for because it's an index. And if you're constantly updating those underlying records, then the index for the view also has to be updated as well. So again, there's overhead in dealing with that. But if it's a pretty static view over a pretty static amount of information, a view and putting an index on a view, being able to create an index view could be a cool option. So let's take a look at this. So here's that view, just a, a quick query of the view. And it's the view itself, it's selecting all the underlying tables as expected because I'm just selecting everything from the view. Nothing too crazy. But now let's add it as part of a join. So I'm just going to join to one table and I am being a little bit more selective with the columns that I'm using, I think. So when I run this. And take this one takes a takes a second. Or two. There we go. Here's our execution plan. And we can see it is an index scan because it's not a selective. I didn't put my where clause on it, but I'm selecting from the index. I'm selecting from my clustered index. That's pretty cool. So I'm not doing everything. I'm going to an index. That's great. So what happens if I expand it out again? And I'm going to add a where clause here. I just want to look for one territory ID and we'll we'll add a uh, the sales order header as well. And so I'm going to run this, be a little more selective, should be hopefully a little faster. Yep, here's my execution plan. And you'll notice that it's not using that index we created. So just like every other index that we create on a table, SQL Server may decide, nope, nope, I, I don't want to use it. It's not what I want and moves along. But it is cool that there is that option for views that we can, that depending on the circumstance, we can put an index on it, save it off, 
and we could potentially have better performance based on it. So yeah, so that's pretty cool. So moving on to the next, let's talk about UDFs. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure my execution plans are on and I'm setting statistic IOs on. So I, I'm going to warn you right now, user-defined functions have a horrible, horrible reputation. Pretty much scalar functions, multi-statement table valued functions, people are like, nope, nope, get rid of those, those are evil. And we're, we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with them. So I'm going to start with scalar functions right now. So we're going to so scalar functions are the single value. So essentially kind of a column return and or when we start talking about that fancy column set or fancy column list, this is where we're going to start pulling that and we're going to start with those for the user defined functions. So again, I'm taking straight from the AdventureWorks database and we have a pretty simple function right here. I'm selecting for the product, I am getting a the the price of the product based on the dates that's being passed in. So pretty simple, just returning this one little variable. So I'm going to look at the query. So this is a pretty simple query and you can see the function right here. So I'm passing in, making it a column, part of my select list. So when I run this, taking a couple seconds. So 34,000 records took, you know, took about five seconds. And if I look at the messages, I see the table usage. So I'm getting some of that IO information for my tables. And while I see some, a work table and a work file, I'm seeing the sales order detail and seeing product. I'm, I'm not quite seeing this product, li product list price history table that I expect to see because I'm selecting from it. And if I look at my execution plan, it, it, it's not here. So this is using my runtime statistics, the actual execution plan, and it's not here. Well, that's odd, but it's also the reason why people don't like scalar functions. Because if I were to display the estimated execution plan, um, you can see here, this is the function. We don't see any of the cost associated with that in this particular database with scalar functions. And when you're trying to troubleshoot, it's a problem. Because if I were to try to write the same query without the UDF and do a comparison between the two, it's a little more funky of a select statement because the way I had to do the left join to get the same information for some reason, it's, it's not pretty. Um, I, I admit that. But this is where we're looking at functions, how they're using. We can see that one, we can see where query cost lies because we don't see the cost of the function when we get the actual, when we look for a query plan with the runtime estimates, because this one thinks the top one is faster. Um, but he, we can look at things like time and we can see here that our second to second our, excuse me, our second query took 936 milliseconds. And our first query took uh, um, four and a half seconds, almost five seconds. So this one is clearly faster. We can see everything we're expecting to see that we don't see here. So this is why scalar functions are, are problematic. We are going to come back to this one. So hold on for that thought. I want to move on to table valued functions next. But this does get into the other reason why we have an issue with this particular scalar function. Sorry, I wanted to mention this before we move on, is that think about what we're doing. This is also, while it's a scalar function, it is a function, but what it's doing is it's going out, it's also a correlated subquery essentially, because for every row, it has to go and run that query. So that's the other reason why this first query is so slow. We don't see it because of the function and we're not seeing it in statistics and we're not seeing it in the query plan. So as I said, we're going to come back and talk about this, but I want to move ahead with the ta table valued functions. So let's come back here and I'm going to start with inline table functions. So I'm modifying a function that SQL Server has. So there's a whole 
functionality of a SQL Server that I don't think is used often. Um, I heard about this based on uh, in a talk that Adam Mechanic gave several years ago, but there is a whole concept called security policies. And what they use are in these inline table valued functions, and then we can get some security information or create security policies, which essentially is a way to implement row level security. You set it up and then it starts applying to your table. So it's actually really cool functionality. But I want to focus on the function here. And so an inline table valued function is really showing where it's taking that concept of a view and almost parameterizing the view, um, making a stored proc out of the view in a sense, you could say. But essentially, we're creating a function. We're saying we're returning a table. We're including the same thing we had for the index view with schema binding. So we can't change the underlying constructs of the table without dropping the view first. And then we're returning our select statement. So it's a select statement and we're using the parameters that are passed in from the function. So I'm going to use a quick example. I'm going to pass in a login ID and I'm going to do a join from the sales order header and I'm doing a left join to my test function and it, right here. So I'm using my function as a table. So it's parameterizing the function um, or passing the parameter to my function. So when I run this, I can look at my execution plan and I can see the employee table and the salesperson that we're, ex that we're using in our table valued functions. And then it's joining to sales order header. So this is kind of working the way we'd expect it to. And we can see what it's doing. We can see the different costs. We can see, uh, yep, everything is here in my stats. And so I can see the IO for it, my reads, physical and logical reads. This is OK. Uh, I don't see too much of a problem because this is kind of working how I'd expect it to do. It's not the same problem as a scalar function where we can't see anything. But that's because we're dealing with an inline table valued function. Multi-statement table valued functions, those are the ones which have the really, really bad reputation. So let's let's take a look at why. So again, this is from the AdventureWorks database. So what makes us different from our inline table valued function? How do we know the difference? One, there's no with schema binding. But this is really the main thing you're going to notice when you look at a function definition to see if it is a multi-statement table valued function. And that is because you are defining the table. You are giving it columns, you're, you're giving it data types, nulls. So you're defining what that table is. So now the other thing is a multi-statement table valued function. If you look, we're actually doing multiple statements here a whole bunch of if depending information. So we're grabbing that information, multi statements in a function, pulling it together. So now let's take a look. So I'm going to select for my UDF by itself. I'm selecting one record, pretty simple. And when I look at my execution plan, um, I just see the function. I, I don't see those underlying tables. I don't see this logic. I don't know what it's actually doing here. And if I go for the estimated execution plan, now I can see what I'd expect that function to be doing. And oh, wow, that's a lot of stuff that it's doing. But I don't see it when I actually run my function. Um, so that's one of the one of the problems. But let's let's take that a step further. So I'm going to start joining it to another table. I'm actually going to use this as a cross apply. And I want to get that information based on that statement and I'm looking at the execution plan and I'm going to look at the estimated rows for everything. So I have my person table, you know, 156 rows that it's pulling back. So because I'm doing the cross apply, it's applying all the rows for my in that function. And you notice the actual number of rows for all executions are, is 156. And it's just again the function. We don't see what it's doing underneath. But if you look at the estimated number of rows, it's 100. And that's on purpose. Microsoft, and, and this is an improvement too, by the way. So what the way that the multi-statement table valued function works is 
Microsoft is just saying, you know what? I see what you're doing here. I'm just going to assume 100 records because I don't know what it's doing. I haven't figured it out. So because of that, it's it's just going to be 100 and we're done. Um, this is an improvement. When these were first released with SQL 20, uh, 2008, the value is one. And you can kind of see, like in this example here, it's not too off kilter because again, a 156 versus 100, that's no, not so big of a difference. Um, I forgot to add that 100 was added for when the cardinality estimator was changed in 2014. Because part of the reason is we need to figure out how, what type of join are we doing between the two tables? Is it a nested loop? Are we ha doing it? You know, do we need to emerge join, hash join? How are we, what, what do I need to do to put these two tables together? Again, here it's not so, so off, 156 actual records versus 100 estimate. But what if it were a million? If I had a million people here and I was returning a million from here, but SQL Server only assumed that 100 rows were coming out, that's going to come up with some pretty, pretty bad plans. And people were coming up with a pretty bad performance for multi-statement table valued functions. So it, it, it didn't work too well. Um, you know, we're doing all of that work and you can compare it to not using the UDFs. But I'm going to skip over that for now because Microsoft heard how bad these plans were and they started making changes starting with SQL 2017. So as adaptive query processing and intelligent query processing has been introduced in the last two versions of SQL Server, table valued function or user defined functions were the area that we really noticed those changes. So if you hadn't noticed before, I had been running these against my 2016 instance. Start, things started changing with 2017. So I'm going to jump over to my 2017 instance. I'm going to turn on my execution plans. I'm setting stats IO on. And we're going to look at that UDF that we just looked at. Again, I'm selecting by itself and I selected things wrong. So let's try it again. Selecting again. One of the things that was not improved with multi-statement table valued functions is we still can't see what it's doing underneath when we run it. All right, so how about that estimate? Same statement I was doing before, person cross apply to my function. And I run it, I look at my execution plan and I'm looking at my the rows and wait a minute, estimated number of rows is still 100. Why didn't that change? That should have changed. Well, it's because it's a cross apply. So there is actually a blog post that talks about it. Interleaved execution doesn't work with cross applies. All right, fine. Let's let's come up with a different function and test that out. So I have a new function here that I created. It's a pretty simple function, doesn't do too much, um, but I'm selecting from these bunch of tables. And so now I'm going to do a, a quick query and I'm going to run my function. I'm doing my join. I'm going to go to my execution plan. Well, still not seeing what it's doing. But when I look at my estimates, it's smarter and it can figure out that I'm only expecting 17 rows. That's so much better than those 100 rows we were seeing before. Because now if it was very disparate numbers, SQL Server is going, it's figuring out how many rows are there, and then it's coming up to figure out what how it needs to join to other tables. So we have better performance issues. Now, 2019, multi-statement table valued functions pretty much is staying the same. But scalar functions, those got to change in 2019. So that's why I wanted to come back to that scalar function that we weren't seeing anything for. So now I'm back on my 2019 instance. And that's what I've been running all the other examples against. So running my state that same statement again looking at my execution plan and i am seeing everything that it's doing so this is kind of uh, i believe it's called inlining so essentially where it was hiding the cost of the scalar function before it's now actually figuring it out and adding the cost into the query plan so we can now actually see what's going on and if i look at my messages I can actually see what's going on. 
In fact, I can actually see that it's essentially a correlated subquery because I have 34,000 records in my row set and this table was hit 34,000 times because for every row returned, my function is being returned. So now I have a better sense when I use a scalar function in SQL 2019, if it's able to be inlined, I can actually now see what's going on. Uh, if we were to look at this, the multi-statement table valued functions, I'm not going to go through these, but that part hasn't changed. But at least we have a chance to have the cardinality estimate improved. So we can still, like we did in 2017, so at least there's a little bit of change there. But again, because of these issues, it's really important not only to know what version of SQL Server you're using and compatibility level, but whether it's what type of function you're creating and really making sure that you, you're using it properly so you have good performance with that. Any other questions? Or are there any questions, I should say? There are no raised hands, but I do want to say all credit to you, because if there are no questions, that means you answered everything in the slides and the demo. Woohoo! Great, and that's what I'm gonna go with too. <laughs> so now, the last thing I wanted to talk about, now that we're talking about fancy row sets, we, uh, we're, we're moving into the column list. So now I want to show you fancy column lists, and that's where we get into Windows Functions. Um, I was so excited when I could start using these. Um, this is this was a lot of fun. So I'm also going to get make sure my execution plans are on. All right. So the first one are row numbers. So when I first started learning SQL, um, I had to do stuff where I had my results set and I needed to create numbering for the rows as part of my select statement. And I pretty much wrote, remembered how I did that and wrote this statement in this example so I could prove that I still knew how to do this. And essentially I'm taking two derived tables and I'm doing a left join on them. And my join criteria is a greater than or equal to. And this does work. And so now I've got my select statement and I've got my row number of where it fits based on that, that join criteria. And I was so excited when I first learned how to do that um, the old school way. Uh, but luckily, windowed functions means that I don't have to create funky select statements like this. I can write cleaner select statements like this, row number over order by product number. And there's a way we can split this a little bit further, and I'll show you examples of that later. But it's really this over clause right here. That's what's going to be your key that you have a windowed function. So my row numbers, I've got the same results and SQL Server did it for me and I'm just selecting from the table once. I don't have to deal with the derived table. Am I getting the columns great? You know, how am I joining it? Making sure I'm doing whatever I need to do for row numbering. SQL Server has an easier way for me to do that. You know, I can change the order by, I'll leave the old school alone and do the new school, new school with the row numberings and I can add it in my order by. So I can now order by those row numbers and I can see my nice list, one, two, three, four, five, right here. So now I wanna return those with the row number under 13. All right, so if I did it old school, I, because I'm using a group by, I can add it in my having, just keep my order there, it works great. Just to show that I can do it. Yep, everything underneath here, new school version, I don't have a group by, but you know, let's throw it in the where clause and whoops, can't do it. Window functions can only appear in select or order by clauses. And I'm my theory on this, I think it's right, but remember going back to our logical order of, of uh, operations, uh, where clause, the where clause is one of the uh, earlier on in the order. Columns are later a couple couple of things after our where clause. So I think the part of the reason you can't do that is because, well, the where clause doesn't know what the column list is yet, so it can't figure it out. Um, that's my theory on it, but luckily there's an easy way around it. It is using our friend, the drive table. So I can take my select statement with the row numbers in, put in the drive table, and then I can do my where clause on my derived table and it works beautifully. It's pretty simple, but like I said, row numbers were those first window functions that I started using and they were great. I love them. But then I started figuring out some of the cooler stuff you could do with windowed functions. And when I talk about fancy row sets, this I think this is where it starts coming into play because I do think this is really cool. Comes into aggregates. 
So when we talk about this, I was saying the over, over part of the aggregate of the windowed function is what's key. So what we notice here is, I'll, let's do this. So we have these aggregates right here. I'm using sum. And for each of those sum, I have an over condition, the over clause, and we can see the partition by. And this is kind of the cool thing because this is what it's saying. What am I doing my sum over? And I'm breaking things apart. If you look at the rest of my select statement, you'll notice something's missing because I'm using aggregates. I have no group by clause because normally we, we, when we learn T-SQL, if you're doing aggregates, you need your group by. That doesn't exist here. And that's what makes these windowed functions so cool. This is what it was really cool is because on a row level, I'm able to do aggregates on a set based and a multiple part set based. So let me run this so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So I'm doing this for one customer. So I have these quantity columns, which are my aggregate columns. So I have all of the informations for all the rows. So there are 33 records for this one customer. So now I have a, a one aggregate, which is the sum by customer order and product. So each one of these ha just happened to have only one item. And you'll notice that for that customer order product, everything's one. But then we can start seeing these, these two columns here, quantity by customer and product and quantity by customer and order. So two, so customer and product. So if I see product ID here, I have one. Uh, there should be here, I see that same product again. So this person has brought that product twice. So I'm able to go through this result set because of that partition by and get aggregates on a row level that's broken out by a different group by. You know, this one is customer and order. You can see for this same order, there are three records in that order. So for each one of those three records, I've got that group. I have that sum for how many, this is one out of three. There are 33 records by the customer. So when I've done the aggregate partition by customer, all of my records now have the same number. Being able to get that sort of flexibility to, to do aggregates, different breakouts within that row set for a row level aggregate, it, it's really cool stuff. It really allows a lot of flexibility. And like I said, the first time I was able to do this, I needed to do the, the um, take a value in one record and have it divided based on an at partial aggregate of other records in the row set. It was really great that I was able to do that because let's think about how we would do this otherwise if we didn't have this. So I've got multiple derived tables and everything is grouped by different levels. So I'm hitting these tables much more than I should be. So being able to do that in one single select statement without having to do all this derived table, it's much cleaner, it's much easier, and you know, it's pretty flexible. Even if I did a CTE where if I just pulled up that information for that one customer, I'm still having to figure out different ways that I'm grouping that information and how I'm rolling it up multiple times. And it's, you know, again, it's doing essentially the same work as it was before. But then you get into the other things that you start thinking about. What are those aggregate means? What other sort of aggregates do we need to do often when we write reports? Rolling aggregates or even comparing what I have now to what I had previously. So there's the lag and there's also a lead uh, aggregate as well. So again, I can do a lag, you know, total due, I want to see the one before over basing on my customer and order date. But I'm also able to get a rolling aggregate. So again, partitioning by my customer, ordering it by my order date, rows unbounded proceeding. So everything that goes before where I am. So I'm going to add a bunch of customers to this list. And we can start seeing that rolling aggregate. Let's let's go down a little. We can see, well, actually, let's start with that customer we were just looking at. We can kind of see the first order total due is 41. It is the first order, so there's no previous. And our cumulative is $41 or yeah, 41. Our next record 
59, previous order 4 to 1, cumulative, both of those. So this plus that. And we're doing the same thing each over as it goes through. How many times do we have reports where we're looking for the average at the end of the day, but we want to see everything all together? How much do we want to see what it was yesterday or what it was you know, the day before or the day after, depending on where you are in that structure, and thinking about how we used to construct those type of queries. This windowed function, that flexibility on a row level to get aggregates on a record set for the row, it's just really powerful to me. And I, I'm just like, okay, this is, this is, you know, kind of cool slice bread. This is, this is what we call fancy. This is uh, pretty fun stuff. And when you're able to find those functionalities, it's really cool. Again, you have to make sure you know what you're doing and make sure that you're testing that it actually is good performance because there are a couple cases where it's not necessarily performs as well as others, but the the flexibility with this just still just kind of blows my mind. So any questions with that? Yes, we have one question from Evan. Go ahead, Evan. Yes. Yes, hi, I just had a, a question. Um, Within your query, uh, you seem to have a lot of, uh, or, or in some cases, over partition by, if you scroll up a bit. Um, oh, no. I, I was just wondering if, uh, for performance reasons, you might consider uh, writing more blocks of code in a CTE using temp tables than joining at the end versus uh, partitioning the data in different ways in a single query with uh, multiple joins, or in this case, one join. Well, let's take a look because I did write the same thing without using it as a window function and I have derived tables here. Um, okay. So, so let's, we can run these and, and we can kind of take a look. Um, I mean, it's always also going to depend on your, your data set. So obviously whatever you do and however you're using it, you're going to want to do this. Okay. I'm going to write it. Do I get an advantage here or do I get an advantage here? Um, right now, the query again, query cost is relative and it's not necessarily fully accurate, but that's a much 22% is, is definitely a, a significant lower cost. Um, let's take a look at the length of time. This one took one millisecond. And this, okay, both of these are pretty fast. So again, oh. again, I start looking at the query. Okay, where am I getting seeks? Um, if I did, I turn stats. I oh, I turn stats. I all on. So I've got a work table with fifty five fifty two reads. So we can see that I'm actually is this doing a little less statistic wise. I'm getting a scan count of twelve. You know, order detail. I'm getting eighty five for the derived table and four. Again, this is a really small data set, to be honest. So thinking about what your data is and how you're doing it. So th this is definitely why I always say what we're doing and as we're getting fancy, it's really cool stuff. But okay. we'd still have to be careful and test and, and use it against your data set and see what works for you. If it doesn't, great. You know, that's fine. Go with the temp tables. Also, again, if you're reusing that data in different ways, maybe that in a store procedure and you're calling it frequently, you know, that's the stuff you're going to want to think about. But here for this example, I would say that the uh, windowed functions, I'd, I'd stick with that. OK. Yeah, but it yeah, it lo looks good. Uh, thank you for explaining. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? No, no, looks uh, very fancy indeed. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I don't see any other raised hands. Um, so. I think we're I think we're good. OK, so again, I'm going to give you access to the script, so you should be able to play with those and just kind of see how those work together. Um, so kind of to recap what we just kind of talked about, I like doing a recap just to kind of refresh our memories, you know, drive tables. They're great because they're commonly used. They're easy to use. You'll see them everywhere. They're kind of the basis for what we do when we start making our select statements uh, more, you know, more more complex. Um, the cons is you can't reuse them from one query to another. And again, the query plan may not reflect what you wanted it to do when that's how you wrote the derived table. CTEs, hierarchical data is really cool. 
And in some cases, you can use them instead of a temp table, but you got to test and see where that works. But again, the cons are they're not, again, like the drive table, it's only for that one select statement. You can have performance issues in certain situations. You just got to test it out and figure out what's going on. And again, is it necessarily faster? Mm, don't know, but is it something you, you'll want to play with and see how it works in your queries? Views. The pros are they're reusable code. And we always have those select statements that we're constantly using. It's great because we can save them. They're great for those prepackaged reports for end users or finding ways to mask data that we don't want people to see our, what our underlying code and our table names and column names really look like. We have a way to prepackage it. Index views, I think those are pretty cool um, if you can find the right situation for them. The cons, execution plans, especially once you start nesting views, they're not necessarily going to be the best things ever. Um, you're going you know, to want to deal with how the execution plans, is it really doing what you want it to do? Index views, if you can't use the, if you're updating the underlying data too much, you're going to have the overhead with the index views. Um, if you're changing data too much, when it's an index, it may not get used by the optimizer. And Views are not about performance. So if anyone who's creating a view thinking you're going to get better performance because you created a view, it's not going to happen. I actually have a blog post by Grant Fritchie that gets to that exact point. User-defined functions. So again, we're talking about reusable code, but we're able to parameterize it, we customize it a little bit more. Uh, the security policy functionality depends on it. I don't know if anyone's used it. Again, I, I know it exists. I don't I don't know if it's commonly used, but it's an interesting piece of functionality if you need more complex row level security. Another pro is SQL Server is working on, Microsoft is working on improving performance for it. It knows it's an issue and it's been working slowly to try to improve it. But that's also the con. There are a lot of negatives. If you're on 2016 or earlier, you're gonna have issues with scalar functions and multi-statement table valued functions. Um, Again, everything we want to see isn't there yet, but it could be coming. But if you're not on that version, you're not going to be able to, to get advantage of it. Windowed functions. That flexibility of the aggregate based on the row level, I, I'm, I'm still just like, that's the coolest thing ever. OK, maybe not ever, but I still think it's pretty cool. And you can get some performance gains on it because you don't have to go through as many joins or drive tables, or as much scans on tables and such. So you can. there are cases where it's really great for performance. The cons, it, it's a small ding that you can't use it in a where clause. Um, we have easy ways around it, but it still feels like it should be listed under a con. And yeah, there are some which have known performance issues. I actually included a blog post about that as well. So when I was putting this together, I was realizing there's a whole bunch of other things that we can do that make our, our select statements not so basic. And I'm calling them additional fancy rabbit holes. Uh, you know, if you have XML or JSON data, if you're doing ro open row set, open query, open XML, if you're selecting over linked servers, all of those have a whole host of things that could be productive or really not worth your time because of major performance issues and so on and so forth. Um, there's cross apply, outer apply. I haven't worked too much with those. So, and I and they're not join statements. So it's really thinking about how those are working and when you want to use a cross apply or outer apply versus an inner join or outer join. Um, the idea of union, union all, intersect, accept. So as I was putting through this, I was trying to decide where I wanted to go with this. But at a certain point, I realized that I was getting to the same same things. And everything that I showed you on how you figure out different performance issues, look at how I'm writing it now, how I'm writing it with this, you know, this different syntax, comparing the two. What am I getting better plans with? What am I getting, you know, better, you know, is it stats? Is it better query plans? Whatever things that performance indicators that I'm looking at, what am I using to determine which one's better? It applies to all of those different things. I'm starting with the basics. But I think as you build upon those and all these other new syntax comes up and all new ways to write these things come into play, you're going to end up being doing the same thing. So this leads me to my final thoughts on this. It's pretty clear there's no silver bullet for troubleshooting. I can't say CTEs are evil because I had a bad 
experience with them because it's not always the case. So it's all about the performance of things. And that's what it's going to boil down to. And you're just going to have to figure out what your performance criteria and acceptability levels are. And then you're going to have to test. And when you're done with that, you'll want to test. And then you're going to want to do a little more testing because you're going to want to make sure that whatever you're choosing is what's going to work. Because your, your mileage may vary. I'm using the AdventureWorks database, and that was my base for my examples. I'm not using massive amounts of data. I'm not doing anything too crazy or complex because I'm not dealing with thinking about what business logic I really need to do. I'm just trying to come up with queries that can show you these different things. That's kind of how the AdventureWorks database was designed as well. So what you're going to face in your database and how your, your production works, what your queries are actually going to look like is going to vary. So you need to look at everything. I tend to keep things simple because of that. I don't want to say, hey, I can use this as CT instead of a derived table. What's, maybe it is simpler, maybe it isn't. But I feel like the more advanced that we try to be, the more we try to trick the optimizer, the more that we do those sort of things, the, the, the more trouble we create for ourselves. So I always like to keep things simple and add as we know what we need to add and we figure out from there. But in the end, it's also something to think about is even if your code doesn't change, SQL, the way SQL Server processes it may. And I think a lot of times we, we write stuff knowing how SQL Server is working or how we think it's going to work. But even as we see improvements for the fun user defined functions between 2016, 17, 19, even before that with the cardinality estimator at 2014, it's the same function. But it changed is how the way it works because SQL Server changes. So that's always one of those things you want to keep track of. As I mentioned, I have a whole bunch of different resources um, for logical query processing. If you want internals, Itzik Ben Gan has some really fantastic articles over here. Um, I mentioned the Eric Darling article, um, some schema binding with views, views and performances, you know, something a little bit of uh, various things that we talked about going through. So I will leave these for y'all to to look at later and read as you as you want. But I don't know if there are any other questions, but I just want to say definitely thank you all so much for coming. If you have any questions, you can email me. I'm on Twitter. Randolph mentioned my blog earlier. And also thank you for that shout out about that uh, particular blog post. I, I wasn't sure if I, people saw it or read it. So thank you for for pointing that out. That actually meant a lot. Um, but also. From my blog, I will have a link to my, I do have a link to my uh, GitHub so you can find the session and get the scripts so you can test them as well. All right, excellent. So welcome to Beyond the Basic Select, the epilogue. So my name's Andy Yoon and we're gonna skip all that kind of stuff because we wanna get to the meat of things. So it's just a couple minutes ago that Deborah was uh, uh, spending some time talking to you guys, but remember one of her key statements, one of her closing statements that even if your code does not change the way SQL Server processes it may. And that's gonna be the theme of this little kind of epilogue here. Let's let, let's kind of elaborate on this one, right? So you guys learned about a whole bunch of new cool toys, right? And I don't know about you guys, but when I get my hands on some new toys, I wanna to play with them, right? So in this context, or, you know, I'm gonna use an analogy and, you know, hey, I got a whole bunch of new kitchen stuff here, right? I love to cook, I love to do all sorts of uh, different things like that, right? So, hey, today's kitchen gadget day. I got a bunch of uh, cool things. So, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bust out my cookbooks. I'm going to try some new recipes that I've never done before because now I got all these new uh, new tools. I uh, Maybe I'll revisit some of my older recipes uh, and try different ways of doing things now that I have new tools to uh, uh, to cook, the, you know, some of those meals with, right? But I'm excited. I want to use all the things and do all the stuff, right? So, hey, let's go, right? But here's the thing. That's the excited Andy. Cautious Andy is actually going to stop you and say, hold on, wait a minute. I'm going to, you know, you, maybe you should restrain yourself just a little bit. Excited Andy says, well, well, why, you know? So here's the thing. These days, especially, you know, given, you know, the current climate and all, Deborah and I are pretty much just cooking for ourselves, right? It's just the two of us. You know, there's not too many, you know, it's not like we're having friends over or anything like that, right? So, you know, and we're doing some really cool things. So, you know what? It's totally fine to take some time to learn how to use some of these cool tools and make, you know, and, you know, further refine, you know, some of our favorite things like, you know, this brisket or this uh, bread here, right? But 
the good news is, is that the tide is turning back in our favor. And very soon, we'll be able to welcome a handful of guests over. Uh, we're actually up for shot number two in about another week and a half or so, right? And, you know, many of our other friends are at different pro uh, states of, uh, uh, of getting, uh, you know, uh, getting their vaccines and stuff like that. And then hopefully soon-ish, we'll even be able to get back to, you know, large gatherings like this, right? I I'm cautiously optimistic, but, you know, I, I, you know th there's always hope, right? So the tide is slowly turning back in our favor. So here's the thing: if we got, if we're welcoming welcoming a bunch of new people uh, to our home, and I'm cooking for them, well, will the recipes that I've been refining that work really well when I'm just cooking for the two of us, will they scale? They may, you know, I may be able to do those same recipes if we had, you know, three, four, five people over. But if uh, we got a couple of dozen uh, sequel family all uh, uh, parachuting in and uh, um, you know coming on over for dinner. I'm going to be a little in a being in a little bit more trouble. I, you know, I'm still going to be trying to make the same, you know, dish or whatever, but I'm going to have to try and approach it in a different way because now I have much more volume. I have to create many, many more of the same dishes. I have many, many more mouths to feed, right? So along those same lines, uh, like a recipe, we have T-SQL code that we might write today, right? Um, many of us have code bases that have been around for quite a while, and even just two years is a long time in the technology world, right? So, you know, we might write a piece of code, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, roll it onto the production as part of our apps, um, and, you know, the code itself doesn't really change, right? You know, so, but what does change over time. Those boxes on the right represents the underlying data that we are processing against, the sizes of our tables, sales order details, sales order header, blah, 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 right? And over time, hopefully your business, your application becomes more successful and continues to grow and or your user base also continues to grow as well. Therefore, your workload increases. What So, you know, think of it not only in, in terms of data volume, but also users using your applications in your code base. Because again, hopefully you're you're working for a company whose application is uh, is successful and you are continuing to grow. So as all of that changes, your code isn't changing. So how does that impact things? Well, what I'd like to do real fast is just give you a quick refresher of the query lifecycle. You know, you got a T SQL query, right? And what SQL Server does is that it passes that into the query optimizer and the query optimizer does a bunch of magic to come up with that execution plan. And it's the execution plan that actually defines the physical operators of what SQL Server is actually going to do because it passes it over to the storage engine. So the execution plan, you know, because like, uh, sorry, so in your T SQL statement, you're not dictating that I want you to do a nested loop join between these two tables. I want you to do an index seek or an index scan here. It's the query optimizer that makes those decisions put those as, puts all that stuff into the execution plan which is then executed by the storage engine now one uh, key caveat behind all of this methodology is that once the storage engine starts executing the execution plan it has no recourse to say oh you know I, I've started doing this and this is kind of crappy you can, you gave me a terrible execution plan it's like the equivalent of sending a dish back to the kitchen right it has no recourse it can't send it back to the query optimizer as it's starting its execution and say dude give me another execution plan this thing is cold this thing is you know something's wrong with this you know the steak is undercooked or whatever right so because of that, you're kind of stuck with it. So you want to give the query optimizer the best chance possible. So to that end, let's go back to that re, um, that recipe idea or that recipe analogy here, right? So, you know, if I'm faced with feeding, you know, 20 people instead of two people and I have this uh, um you know, this uh, pasta dinner recipe, you know, it's not too hard to, you know, follow these directions, but, you know, more advanced cooks will, you know, potentially look at this recipe and, you know, come up with some different courses of action, say, you know, maybe consolidate a few steps and whatnot. And that's kind of what the query optimizer is doing. It's coming up with its own game plan, one that it thinks is more optimal. But what a lot of people uh, often forget or maybe no, don't realize about the query optimizer is that when it's coming up with an execution plan, the goal of the optimizer is not to come up with the best plan possible. Instead, the goal of the query optimizer is to come up with a good enough plan quickly. It has a limited amount of time. And such, let's come back to this recipe. If you had to feed or you know, uh, you know, know, cook this dinner for you know, at scale at for 20 people instead of just two, can you come up with a game plan in a limited amount of time? Think about that for a second and go.
as I conveniently take a drink. So you had a limited amount of time, but unfortunately your time is up now. Were you able to come up with a much better game plan to feed 20 people as opposed to two? Probably not. And the same goes for T-SQL. If you give the query optimizer a ridiculously complex uh, statement, it's going to have a harder time coming up with that optimal execution plan for you. Okay. So what I'm going to do right now, this is just a lightning talk. So I'm going to do what I call a pseudo demo. I have Plan Explorer up here, a free tool by Century One, looks at uh, execution plans, yada, yada, yada. But it, frankly, it was just easier for me to present to you a bunch of information about some code that I ran. So what I did here, let's look at the command text here, and I'll do some zoom in action. I adapted one of Deborah's uh, existing uh, um, the uh, demo examples and I threw it into a bunch of CTEs and this one kind of hits home to me because frankly when I first discovered CTEs many years ago I thought they were the best things since sliced bread and I started using them all over the place without fully understanding some of these consequences that I'm talking to you about now you'll also notice that there's also a scalar user defined function in this example piece of code here as well and also with this CTE you may notice that you know the detail CTE I'm actually referencing it again down here in the order CT. So there's a bit of kind of nesting action going on here, right? And for what it's worth, all of this code has been run in SQL Server 2019. So we're able to actually take advantage of inlining uh, for our scalar user-defined functions. So let's take a look at the um, the results or you know the underlying you know uh, uh, metrics performance metrics when I actually ran this against uh, AdventureWorks. So you know uh, it didn't take very long whatsoever. You know it did a moderate amount of logical reads here, for example, and you know it turned back you know a decent number of rows, but not all too much, right? But here's the thing. This was done against a vanilla copy of AdventureWorks, and AdventureWorks is a relatively tiny database. And as I was talking about before, if your code doesn't change, the way SQL Server may pr uh, processes it may, if other factors change, I, that I'm kind of adding on to the phrase that Deborah had uh, concluded with, right? And in this case, if your workload volume changes, or in this specific example, if the volume of data that you are querying changes and to that i'm going to show you this so this is a different pe session file of the same exact code that was run against a slightly different variant of uh, adventureworks uh, using jonathan caius's expansion script but i ran it like something like seven eight times over uh, so it's a much much larger version of adventureworks to kind of simulate what would happen as your data grows over time it may not grow overnight but maybe two three years from now where your uh, business has grown from 10 customers Customers to 100 customers or 1,000 customers. Now that's a problem that many of us face over time, right? And you can even see just from this execution plan here, I'm not even going to zoom into it, that the query or the execution plan shape has changed. Let me just jump back here. The shape looked completely different because we had different operators, different things that are going on. But now, because we have more underlying uh, data, the optimizer has, cho a has chosen a completely different approach. And Unfortunately, because none of the code changed, even we've scaled out our data, underlying resource utilization has increased dramatically and the duration has uh, increased dramatically. This is a perfect example where, you know what, we got away with it just fine through using all the fun tools because I was just, you know, uh, you know, working against a small set of data or, you know, the analogy, I was just cooking for two. It wasn't that big of a deal. But now if I'm cooking for 20, I got to change up my game plan. I got to pare back a little bit and I may have to, you know, break things up, uh, you know, have some friends help me out or whatever the case may be to go along that silly analogy. So in either case, uh, I don't want to discourage you from using, you know, all the cool stuff that you just learned, but I do want to encourage you to edit yourself and you know pick and choose which things you make use of rather than just using it for the sake of using it because it's really cool and awesome. So with that, Here's the information about me, you know, because I was doing an epilogue, I thought I also threw the bio at the end because frankly, no one really cares about all this kind of stuff, except for my contact information, my Twitter um, handle and my email address down there. But I hope you enjoyed this little epilogue and I hope you enjoyed Deborah's presentation. Thank you, Randolph, for welcoming us again tonight. And uh, um, yeah, that's about it.